In this lecture, we'll talk about the spinal cord and the brainstem conditions because uh, some of these uh, conditions are, have relationship with the blood supply. So let's talk about the blood supply of the spinal cord first. The blood supply of the spinal cord came from two primary sources which are the vertebral artery and the, the uh, descending arteries. So the vertebral artery, if you look at the uh, picture, you can see um, there are two vertebral artery, and then they arise from the subclavian artery. And then the uh, thoracic and the abdominal aorta, the another source of the um, spinal cord blood supply. The next few slides are on the blood supply of the spinal cord and some of the key arteries such as the anterior spinal artery located in the ventral uh, median fissure supplies the anterior two-thirds of your spinal cord and then the posterior spinal arteries supply the posterior third of the spinal cord. In addition to the ventral spinal artery and the posterior spinal arteries, you have what's known as segmental arteries that come off the aorta at each kind of level of the spinal cord, and then they connect with either the posterior spinal arteries or the anterior spinal artery. So we basically have covered the central nervous system at the spinal cord level up to this point. So let's make it clinically relevant and start talking about injuries to the spinal cord. Most injuries to the spinal cord are either traumatic, is the ones you normally think of, motor vehicle accidents, falls, violent attacks, sports-related spinal cord injuries, but you also can have atraumatic spinal cord injuries. Spinal cord injuries are because of infections or tumors or vertebral subluxations or neurological diseases that affect the axons, for example, and, and the gray matter in the spinal cord, like MS, ALS, and transverse myelitis. The spinal cord injury could cause motor or sensory impairment. There are some terminology for the motor impairment, the hemiplegia, the paraplegia, or quadriplegia. So try to answer or explain it before you look at the next slide. Now, spinal cord lesions are typically defined as the level of lesion defined as the most distal spinal cord segment level at which the musculature is at least 3 plus strength. So, for example, a complete, which means completely across the spinal cord, C4 lesion means that C4 level is intact. So if that was the case, you would have most of your diaphragm innervated you would have be able to elevate your scapula and retract the scapula because C4 is the major component of the innervation to those muscles. And you'd have sensation over your upper traps and above. That's a complete lesion. Most spinal cord injuries are incomplete. In other words, they're not completely across one segment. They kind of maybe go diagonally. So there you're going to have motor and sensory levels have to be rated separately one side to the other. For example, you could have a, the right side, they have sensory at C6 and motor at C5, but the, level, the left side, sensory at C7 and motor at C6.
This is a well-known impairment scale from the American Spinal Injury Association. And they kind of grade the amount of impairment that a person has after a spinal cord injury, everywhere from A, which is complete spinal cord injury with no motor or sensory function, to E, which is basically a return to normal function. And so you have every, everything else in between is an incomplete. So it could be maybe they have some sensory, but no motor function below the level of the lesion. Uh, incomplete C would be motor function of key muscles below the lesion at a grade that's less than three. So that's a little bit better. Or a D, which is a little better than that, motor function of key muscles that's at a level of grade uh, three or, or higher. We know that there are two motor neurons in the uh, motor pathways, the upper motor neuron and the lower motor neuron. So the upper motor neuron is the cell body located in the cerebral cortex and the axis, uh, the axon goes to the anterior horn of the spinal cord where the uh, lower motor neuron cell body located. And then the lower motor neuron um, send the axons outside the spinal cord and innervate the muscles. So most of the uh, spinal cord injury could be considered uh, as an upper motor neuron uh, injury. And the lower motor neuron and the upper motor neuron lesion could have different characteristics. There are um, muscle strains, muscle tones, um, and uh, the uh, stretch reflex or uh, will this um, muscle have the atrophy or it have other different signs, which has been summarized in this form. Now, when a person has a spinal cord injury, typically they go into what's called spinal shock initially, and that can last for weeks or longer. And it's thought to be due to a, a, just a total disconnection of the higher levels to the lower level, to the motor neurons below the lesion. And you can't really then determine how much impairment and how much return of function the person has until they come out of this spinal shock. And that's determined by a neurologist by one or two, one or the other of these two reflexes, the bulbocavernosus reflex or the clitoroanal reflex. Once those reflexes have returned, then they can determine how much motor function and sensory function they now have below the level of lesion. Another complication of the spinal cord injury is something called autonomic hyperreflexia or dysreflexia. And that occurs to a lesion that's above T6. And it's considered a medical emergency because the blood pressure can rise dramatically. And that can be set off by a decubitus ulcer, an impacted bowel, a distended bladder, anything below the level of the lesion that kicks off the sympathetic nervous system and causes it to be hyperactive. And that causes uncontrolled vasoconstriction of the blood vessels below the level of the lesion, which can't be controlled from higher centers. And the blood pressure can shoot up. So it's a medical emergency. Also, obviously with the spinal cord injury, you're gonna have thermal regulatory problems below the level of the lesion. So example, they cannot control the temperature below the level of the lesion. So if you take a spinal cord injury patient out uh, that they're not dressed appropriately in the cold weather, they cannot regulate their body temperature below the level of the lesion. Or if it's too hot and you've got them dressed too warmly, they can't control that. So you have to consider that when you're working with a spinal cord injury patient, 
you have to consider what the temperature is because they can't control that temperature below the level of the lesion. And then a real common complication of spinal cord injuries are spasticity. Spasticity has been defined a number of ways, but according to your book, they define it as velocity-dependent hypertonia. What does that mean? That means velocity dependent. If you're moving the, the extremity very slowly, the tone doesn't increase that much. But if you move the, the muscle, lengthen it very quickly, then you'll get more tone building. So that's the hypertonia. So faster movement, you get increased resistance to passive movement. And there's a lot of fears of what's causing the spasticity in the spinal cord injury patients. Now, one of them that has been common is hyperreflexia. In other words, uh, any little stretch of the muscle, the muscle spindles cause an increased reflex contraction of that muscle that can't be controlled from higher centers because it's cut off from the higher centers if, the lesion, if it's below the level of the lesion. Also, the reticular spinal tract that I had mentioned before tends to be overactive, causing hype, hypertone hypertonicity in muscles because the reticular spinal tract is not being controlled and, and somewhat dampened by the higher centers. And then once you've had spasticity for a while, this really high tone in the muscle, you start getting contractures forming and that makes it even harder then to straighten out the arm and to lengthen that muscle. You also have a uh, weak actin and myosin bonding that's occurring. So in other words, instead of a lot of those cross bridges coming apart to allow the muscle to relax, you've still got a lot of uh, little cross bridges still formed, still keeping a higher tone than would normally be the case. Some other complications of spinal cord injury, they're gonna have a lot of times urinary bladder dysfunction, a bowel dysfunction, sexual dysfunction, hyperreflexia because they can't control the reflexes. Because remember, the reflex is a monosynaptic reflex. It goes from the muscle into the spinal cord back to the muscle. That's normally dampened by higher centers, but it can't if, the, if that uh, monosynaptic reflex is below the level of the lesion. So if you, uh, if you look at urinary bladder dysfunction, they categorize it if the lesion's above S2, 3, and 4, segments, then they have a neurogenic bladder or an upper motor neuron bladder. The bladder fills and it just reflexly empties because the, the, the bladder, when it fills, sets off stretch reflexes in the walls of the bladder. That goes into the spinal cord and causes a reflex uh, contraction of the bladder. And you can't control that if that's occurring um, below the level of the lesion. Uh, if you have a lesion at S2, 3, and 4 below, then you have a lower motor neuron bladder. So the bladder doesn't empty unless you manually empty it, and that's or, or put a catheter in there as well. So that's a lower motor neuron bladder versus an upper motor neuron bladder. And then there's also something called orthostatic hypotension. When a person goes from a reclining position to a more upright position, normally the, there's a blood pressure drop that's countered by reflexes and the blood pressure stays high enough to maintain consciousness. But with a spinal cord injured patient, they don't have that response as well. And so if you put the spinal cord injured patient in an upright position too quickly, they could pass out on you. Some other complications that can occur with a spinal cord lesion is pneumonia because they're not breathing uh, properly, especially if they're a quadriplegic and don't have full function of the diaphragm. Uh, respiratory complications goes along with that. Uh, pressure ulcers because they, if they're not turned regularly, they can develop pressure ulcers, deep vein thrombosis because they're not able to move the legs to get the blood flow. And of course, contractures, um, 
eventually most of um, the limbs would go into some amount of spasticity. And when that occurs over a period of time, the connective tissues in the, within the muscle get very tight. And now you have the additional complication of contractures to decrease range of motion. And then pain is another complication of spinal cord lesions. Like I had mentioned before, most spinal cord lesions are not transversely completely across at one level. They're mo more often incomplete. They're either they don't go completely across the spinal cord or they go at some oblique angle. So here's a, a couple incomplete spinal cord lesions. One's anterior cord syndrome, which is depicted on the upper left. Um, <clears throat> Here, oftentimes, a forceful flexion injury, which could be a, a motor vehicle accident. You would lose pain and temperature bilaterally and motor function bilaterally. And you should go back to your previous slides to kind of determine why. I'll tell you why now. You would lose pain and temperature bilaterally because you lose the lateral spinothalamic tracts located in the lateral funiculus, which both those tracts are transmitting pain and temperature and you would have basically lost those tracks. You would lose motor function bilaterally because you've knocked out the ventral gray horns, which house the alpha and gamma motor neurons to the extremities. But your dorsal column sensations, two-point discrimination, fine discriminatory touch, vibratory sensation, and conscious proprioception, those sensations that are being transmitted through the dorsal funiculi could be spared because the lesion may not migrate that far posteriorly to affect those. Central cord syndrome depicted in the upper right is a lesion that starts in the middle and kind of spreads out. Uh, oftentimes a hyperextension injury, again, could be a motor vehicle accident. Here you would lose pain and temperature bilaterally at least because the pain and temperature information coming from one side would cross in the anterior white commissure to get go up the opposite side and then the other side does the same thing. So the crossing fibers of pain and temperature in the anterior commissure would be affected by this type of a lesion. Again, go back to those slides that covered that for a review of that. Another incomplete spinal cord lesion is brown sequad syndrome and in this case, what you see on the lower left, half of the spinal cord is damaged. So with that being the case, you would have ipsilateral loss of motor function and the ipsilateral loss of dorsal column sensations because you lose ipsilateral loss of motor function because you lose the lateral corticospinal tract, which is carrying uh, motor fibers down to, to innervate the alpha and gamma motor neurons in the ventral gray horn. Again, go back to the slide to find that. You would also lose the dorsal column sensations on, on that side. Two-point discrimination, vibratory sensation, fine discriminatory touch and conscious proprioception on that side because that information is being transmitted up through the fasciculus, gracilis, and cuneatus on that side. Syringomyelia is another kind of central cord um, injury where you develop a fluid-filled cyst. So syringomyelia and central cord syndrome could have the same type of uh, signs and symptoms. And finally, a term you'll see often in the clinic, myelopathy, myelo meaning brainstem, basically, and pathy, of course, pathology of it, or myelo, I'm sorry, meaning spinal cord. Myelo means spinal cord. And so pathology of the spinal cord. And there you could have symptoms bilaterally depending on how much of the spinal cord is, is damaged. You often see that with a cervical myelopathy diagnosis. In other words, a bulging disc in the cervical spinal cord that pushes a central uh, bulging disc that pushes into the spinal cord 
can cause a myelopathy of the cervical spinal cord. Now, cardioquinus syndrome is not a spinal cord injury. However, it affects all those nerve roots that project down from the spinal cord, your cauda equina. And it's more than of a lower motor neuron type of a lesion. Any kind of lesion of the spinal cord, the brainstem, or the brain would be considered an upper motor neuron lesion. But a lesion of the peripheral nerves or the, or the cauda equina would be considered more a lower motor neuron lesion because it's not a lesion of the spinal cord or the brain. So a lower motor neuron lesion is characterized by flaccid paralysis. And in this case, cauda equina would be the lower, lower extremity muscles. Uh, reduced bowel and bladder function, especially a large disc protrusion, L5S1 pushing in and catching those S2, 3, and 4 fibers coming down centrally. And again, another uh, characteristic sign of a lower motor neuron lesion would be hypo or areflexia because you've disrupted that reflex arc from the muscle spindle into the spinal cord and back. Again, go back to that slide to review that so that you would know why with cauda equina syndrome, you would have hypo or areflexia. A very common diagnosis you'll come across in the clinic is spinal stenosis. Stenosis is a Greek word that means narrowing. So it's narrowing of either the IV foramen and or the central canal. And it's being narrowed by, as you can see in the upper right picture, being narrowed by bulging discs or bone spurs coming from the facet joints, or the ligamentum flavum being degenerated and develop a lot of calcium and it becomes hard and it protrudes into the central canal. Those are the structures that typically cause central or IV foramen stenosis. And so the symptoms would just simply vary. It depends on what's being pinched in, in, in that process. It could be the whole spinal nerve being pinched or maybe just the ventral roots or the dorsal roots. So the signs and symptoms will vary, but it's good to know what that spinal stenosis is. You also may come across uh, post-polio syndrome diagnoses. And polio in the first place was a viral infection that, de that caused degeneration of alpha motor neurons in the ventral gray horn. So it destroyed the alpha motor neurons in the ventral gray horn. Those would have gone out to innervate musculature. And so the person has a lot of weakness when they had polio. Uh, what happens though, as you'll see in the next slide, some of the neurons that were not destroyed can branch out and synapse on motor muscle cells that were denervated by a damaged alpha motor neuron. And you'll see that on the next slide. So some of the existing non-injured motor neuro, alpha motor neurons branched out to innervate uh, other muscle cells and therefore the person didn't feel quite as much weakness. The problem is after about 30 years or so, those branches degenerate. And now all of a sudden the person's got post-polio syndrome. They start having the same weakness they had way back when they initially had the the disease. These arrows are pointing to the ventral gray horns which contain the alpha and gamma motor neurons. So in polio, the viral infection destroyed the alpha and gamma motor neurons. This slide illustrates what I talked about previously, how here you see the normal um, condition at, at the top where you have these, basically you have four motor neurons synapsing on individual muscle cells. And then with polio, you lost two of them in this diagram. And what you can see happen in C is the existing neurons then branched out to innervate those now denervated muscle cells. But over about 30 pe year period of time or so, you end up with what you see in D, atrophy of those 
branches and now you're back to where you were when you originally had it. Almost all the brainstem is uh, supplied by the vertebral artery and basal artery. You can see in this picture the two vertebral arteries combined together and then ascending on a, through this um, uh, basal sulcus and uh, formed an basal artery. And then all these uh, three arteries send a lot of branches to the brain stem. The damage of the brain stem reading uh, usually caused by a vascular problem. It could be a hemorrhage or lack of uh, blood supply, uh, such as uh, lock-in syndrome. Uh, we know that uh, the uh, inside the basal pans, you have this cortical spinal and uh, cortical pontine tracts. So lack of blood supply could have damage to this tra tract, and then this could result in the paralysis of limb the trunk and the face. The patient can only communicate with others by blinking or, or some eye movement. And this patient could have full uh, cognitive ability. And if you have interest into this um, condition, you can uh, Look at this, uh, the, the, the diamond bell and the butterfly. It's a memoir by a journalist, uh, Dominic Bob, and uh, it's derived, uh, described his life uh, before and after a massive stroke, uh, which left him with uh, lock-in syndrome.